Thanks for this fun opportunity. And thanks to In Their Footsteps and Lewis and Clark National Historic Park to cover a person that I've had fun uh, studying, Captain George Flavel and his influence on Astoria. Lewis and Clark opened the gateway to the West. One of the first things their journey sparked was a desire on the part of President Thomas Jefferson and others to open up the Pacific coast to fur trading with the world, including Asia and China. It would also cement American control on a coast where four powers vied for control, Britain, Mexico, Russia, and America uh, vied for control of the Pacific coast. A few years after Lewis and Clark made their journey, John Jacob Astor met with President Jefferson. Already, uh, Astor was trading furs around the world. They sparked each other's vision for the West Coast, and then Astor sent first a ship, the Tonkin, and then an overland party to open up the Pacific Coast to that fur trade. These journeys opened up uh, Astoria. Uh, they named Astoria at the mouth of the Columbia River, and they opened it up in the spring of 1811. Though hampered by weather and mountainous waves, uh, you can see a picture of a ship entering the bar and a small ship on a uh, turbulent, perilous ocean. Uh, the picture of the, the Tonkin entering in the bar, you can see a small rowboat nearby and it's overturned, spilling its occupants. They lost several crew members in the attempt to cross the bar. Uh, and, and the Columbia River bar is notoriously dangerous. The fort they founded, and you'll see a picture of that two years after its founding, surrounded by a palisade fence, uh, log buildings outside for lodging and warehouse. On the corners of the fort are two bastion towers which had swivel guns in them. In front of the fort are four mounted cannons pointed toward the ocean. A U.S. flag flies from the tall flagstaff near the cannon. But soon the fort went under British control to Hudson's Bay Company uh, because of warfare. And it was not until 1946 that control of the area returned to America. But as the British moved their fur trade and commerce to Fort Vancouver, Astoria languished as a mere outpost. But Lewis and Clark had also opened another nationwide impact, and that was the Oregon Trail, where in the 1840s, a stream of pioneers grew and sought prosperity in the West. Among those was the family to which Mary belonged. She would become Captain George Flavel's wife. Though the trail had the adversity of a long overland journey with many hazards, the sea journey and ships that came also had their own challenges. The Columbia River Bar became known as the graveyard of the Pacific. Over the years, 2,000 ships have foundered, attempting to cross the bar with subsequent loss of life. The California Gold Rush of 1849 sent a stream of people west, and many came by ship. One sea captain came was Captain George Flavel, captain of the John Petty. He came at age 25. The picture of George Flavel as a young man, 25 years old, roughly, uh, clean shaven, wavy dark hair, a nice black suit, uh, a coat with shiny lapels, a bow tie, and a white shirt. Though some felt that Flavel was born in Protestant North Ireland, census takers say his birth and that of his parents was in New Jersey. He came from Norfolk, one of the oldest cities of the Hampton Roads. It had blossomed as a major port city and by the late 1700s was one of the most prosperous cities of Virginia, a major shipbuilding center and central transshipment point for import and export leaving January 1849 with 14 passengers and merchandise for the gold rush. The type of ship Flavel captained was a brig. It was a sailing vessel with two square rigged masts. They were fast and maneuverable and it was a design used for both merchant ships and for naval vessels. It was popular in the 18th 
and early 19th centuries. A brig required a relatively large crew, however, for its small size, and it was difficult to sail into the wind. Clavel's arrival in San Francisco in the fall of 1849, after a journey around the Horn of South America, they had an accident uh, for which they had to get repairs, which delayed them a bit. But their arrival in, in San Francisco brought them to the gateway of the gold fields or the Golden Gate. But the harbor was filled with ships and the market was overstocked. Though most of the passengers uh, disembarked, he sold precious little of his cargo. But the word on the street was that he would find a market several days north in Portland, a city growing as the hub of the lush Willamette Valley, which increasingly welcomed pioneers. He went north along the coast, crossed the perilous Columbia River Bar, where the Columbia joins the Pacific Ocean. The perilous nature of the bar was stated by Lieutenant Wilkes of the XX Exploring Expedition a few years earlier. Wilkes said, mere description can live, give little idea of the terrors of the bar of the Columbia. All who have seen it have spoken of the wildness of the scene and the incessant roar of the waters representing it as one of the most fearful sights that can possibly meet the eye of the sailor. After passing the bar at the time, which had two channels that gave access to the river, uh, they passed small historic Astoria. At the time it was called Ramshackle. And uh, you can see the picture of the small, simple town. Uh, boats and canoes are near the shore and one man is in the stream, pulling two logs toward the shore. In back of the village is a wooded ridge. Smoke comes from the chimney of one home. Whether he anchored in the stream and uh, went into the city, we, we are not told. But we do know that he went on to sell his cargo at, in Portland. On that date, the Oregon Spectator newspaper advertised that goods from the John Petty, goods from the United States, it said, were sold at the Portland docks. All Flavel's cargo was sold at profit. Flavel continued to captain the John Petty but also tried his hand at the gold fields for a short period. But finding that his real opportunity was on the water, he returned quickly to captain not only the John Petty, but also to captain the Goliath, a steamship carrying miners to Sacramento and running up the coast. And you can see the image of this steamship uh, Goliath. He then became pilot and first mate on the Gold Hunter, a large ship that belonged to the Portland town site, and it also made runs up the coast. When he transited Astoria, he stayed often at the Astoria Hotel, and you can see a picture of this small hotel built by Conrad Bowling. A dirt street in front, a wooden sidewalk running from the hotel to nearby buildings. Residents of the hotel and townspeople, children, and a cat are on the walk outside. After his prospecting in the gold fields uh, came to an end, he came back with a sack of gold. Conrad and his wife and family had come to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. When they came, they're described as driving two prairie schooners, two yoke of oxen on each uh, wagon, and he carried hardware for a sawmill. And initially when he arrived, uh, a little bit west of the Astoria area, Young's River, he began to set up that sawmill. But when news came of the gold rush, he and other men of the area evacuated to seek their fortune in the gold fields. He returned with a sack of gold, but instead of finishing the sawmill, he built the Astoria or Bowling Hotel. In Captain George Flavel transiting the Columbia River Bar, he was often assisted by bar pilots. Uh, on, on a ship, Mary Taylor, captained by a Jackson Hustler. And you can see a picture of some of these pilots in black suit coats, white shirts, and black bow ties. 
All of them have dark beards and three have mustaches. Three men are seated and two are standing. The central seated figure uh, has a prominent gold watch chain uh, curving from his coat. Almost all of these pilots ended up working for Flavel, who re replaced uh, the previous ship, Mary Taylor, out on the bar uh, once Flavel started piloting. Almost all of these pilots ended up working for him, and it was a successful uh, match. In the perilous nature of the Columbia River Bar, Flavel saw his opportunity to settle in Astoria and pilot ships uh, coming and going from the bar. He had heard that the, the, the previous bar ship, Mary Taylor, uh, captains and owners were dissatisfied with their service. Maybe they were not available when needed. But on December 9th, 1850, Flavel applied to the Oregon Board of Pilot Commissioners in Portland. He probably hand delivered the letter as he did not uh, he was often in Portland, and he did not have long to wait for an answer. Only days later, the board answered that this experienced ship captain, and he was appointed a bar pilot for the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. Flavel chose to center his piloting on the most difficult part of those waterways, the challenging Columbia River bar. In early 1852, Flavel, along with another pilot, bought the ship California and replaced Mary Taylor uh, out on the bar. He hired four pilots to work with them. He became known himself as a fearless and expert bar pilot. Perhaps the greatest test came when he piloted the steamship General Warren over the bar outbound. But once outbound, the ship ran into a gale, lost one of her masts and sprang a leak. She returned, was met by the California, who was surprised to see her again. The captain told Flavel he had to get back into Astoria for repairs. But, but sadly, the, the ship had been seriously damaged. Water was rising in the hold. Uh, and Flavel told Captain Thompson that he could not make it into the bar and to Astoria. The ship was in too uh, rough a condition. The weather conditions were, were not favorable, but Captain Thompson insisted. And as they debated this issue, whether they should try to go back to Astoria, try to get over the bar, passengers ended up being part of the debate. Finally, Flavel says, well, I will take you into the bar, but I will not be responsible for the results. The ship condition was deteriorating. The captain, after they had just crossed the bar, darkness fell, snow began falling, and the ship condition was deteriorating. And the captain said to Flavel, his pilot, if we are going to save our passengers, we are going to have to beach her. Flavel agreed, and the ship wrecked on Clatsop Spit. But when it hit Clatsop Spit, it began breaking up. There was one small boat left, and Flavel left with oarsmen in this small boat to seek to bring help to rescue the people. But when he returned with help along with a whale boat, everything was lost. The passengers could not be saved. But Flavel's courage in going to the rescue was honored by the city of Portland, who gave him a gold medal commemorating the attempted uh, rescue. In that rescue, once they, they left the ship, they went about halfway to Astoria and they saw a light on the land at a place called Tansy Point. And it was there that there was the home of a pioneer, uh, Kindred, and uh, he uh, fed them breakfast. His wife treated their hands. Uh, finally, they made it to Astoria and then came back to the ship, but none were saved that were left on the ship. Having established his successful bar piloting business with his ship, California, uh, stationed on the bar, he had four pilots. But after he'd established his business, he thought about matrimony. 
He stayed in the Astoria Hotel uh, when he was in Astoria, run by the Bowling family, and he met their young daughter initially when he was captaining the uh, Goliath, Mary Christiana Bowling, and that was when she was about 10 that he came as captain of the Goliath. She had grown learned English uh, after her native German, and she went to the Portland Women's Academy. Flavel proposed marriage to Mary and gained the approval of her father, Conrad. They were married March 1854 at the home of her sister and her husband, bar pilot Moses Rogers, one of the ones pictured with the uh, pilots before. They were ferried there uh, to that home on Moses Rogers' boat. They were married in Astoria and one of the, excuse me, they were married on Lewis River at Moses Rogers' home to avoid chivalry back in uh, Astoria. Th this was a hazing with noisy pots and pans done by friends for a newly married couple, uh, but they wanted to avoid the chivalry. At the time they married, the captain was 31 and Mary just 14. But though they may have lived originally in the hotel after marriage, Flavel soon purchased a two-story house and land from a fellow pilot, Asa Cole Farnsworth. The land would later be used to build their mansion, the Flavel House. Mary, having served in her father's hotel, doing housekeeping, cooking, and serving, uh, it was said that in her new home, it was a well-kept home. Uh, when she did her work in the hotel, it was described that sometimes 100 uh, men would arrive at one time, starved for home cooking. And so the bowling family, they had their hands full uh, entertaining and lodging all of these uh, ones that came in on ships that would come in. Following their wedding in the, the Christmas of the same year, uh, the city of Astoria appointed Flavel as harbor master for the port of Astoria. Though unsalaried, it gave Flavel the authority to regulate the timing of ships that crossed the bar. He also supervised operations in the harbor area and enforced its rules. And, and it shows what it, with what esteem he was held by the city. In addition to his piloting on the bar with the ship California in the next year, Flavel purchased the ship Halcyon in San Francisco. In it, he carried ice south to San Francisco and returned with cargo for Fort Vancouver at a good profit. But with the ship, he also attempted to ship lumber from a friend's sawmill near Astoria to San Francisco. It's interesting, this, this friend uh, that was operating the sawmill was Henry Aiken, and he was Mary Flavel's girlhood tutor who tutored her in English. So that's a, uh, a fun story to listen to. Uh, and he was her tutor once they got to Astoria. He had come with them down the Oregon Trail and he was a sawmill man himself. Though their first load of lumber was sold at good profit in San Francisco, financial disaster awaited. When they came with their second load of lumber, um, the market had bottomed out and Flavel had to sell the Halcyon to meet obligations and costs. So he largely shouldered the loss himself, an act of uh, real character. Uh, one commenting on the financial disaster of both the captain and Henry Aiken says that they bankrupted themselves in short order. After the loss, Captain Favell recapitalized his bar piloting business by partnering with shipbuilder Asa Mead Simpson, who owned shipyards and sawmills. It was a marriage made in heaven as both these professionals had a good head for business and profit. They employed superior equipment, the best bar pilots, and business acumen that overcame all competition. In their family, the first child of George and Mary was George Conrad, and uh, you'll see the image there of Mary and her first child, uh, son George Conrad. He later became a ship captain and pilot, and 
he was, but later he was urged by his parents to give up the sea. He settled in Astoria and helped manage his father's many business interests, including tugboats, shipping, and piloting. And so he was a big help there. Next in their family, their second child was Nellie. And she became a pianist and organist uh, in part for her church. And it was said by friend uh, Polly McKean Bell, we'll hear a little bit more from her, uh, that Nellie was her dad's favorite. And she shared with her dad rather luxurious tastes, it says. He could be persuaded to agree with almost any grand plan of hers. Then the third child was Katie, and she was a singer. The girls took music lessons, not only in Astoria, but also in San Francisco, where more was available, and later in Europe. And often the girls uh, performed together. Sailing on the California and Oregon coast, Flavel had often admired the sailing ship Jane A. Falkenberg, which was never known to make a slow passage. And you may see the picture of the Jane A. Falkenberg, which was known as Flavel's favorite ship. With uh, three masts, and the front mast to this ship had square facing, say a square mounted sails, but then the back two masts were fore and aft sails, so a little bit different uh, appearance. Uh, the ship is riding relatively low in a mild sea. The ship became available when the owner and captain uh, was killed on the San Francisco docks. What happened was an unruly horse uh, backed his carriage off the dock he died of severe injuries in a few minutes. Uh, Flavel made the new owner of the ship such a good offer that they turned the vessel over to him, sold him the Jane A. Falkenberg. Perhaps the most serious challenge to Flavel's domination of pilotage occurred when Captain Paul Corno arrived on the bar with a 100-foot steam tug, Raboni. He sought to put Flavel and his pilots out of business and take over California's trade. And he boasted to his pilots that they would very shortly uh, put Flavel out of business. Now, a steam tug was a completely different operation than, for example, the California putting a pilot on a ship, climbing up a rope ladder onto a ship and taking the ship over the bar. A steam tug was completely different. It towed the ship across the bar. With Corno's appearance, um, shippers from Portland and the Willamette Valley hatched a scheme to drive Flavel out of business, complaining about his high rates. They successfully urged the pilot commissioners to revoke the licenses of Flavel's pilots with the objective of bestowing a monopoly on Corno. The new monopoly lasted just three days as the well-connected Flavel was able to secure other licenses of his three pilots up the Washington coast in Oysterville, the Pacific County seat. Flavel and his pilots were back in business on the bar. But still desiring a tugboat on the bar, the, the Oregon legislature and the pilot commissioners offered a subsidy for five years for a tugboat to be placed on the bar, and they offered $12,000 for the first year of operation. Flavel saw this as a choice opportunity to diversify his pilotage operation and add a powerful tugboat. He acted quickly to accept the pilot's commission. He contracted for the tug Astoria to be built in San Francisco. And when it arrived, Flavel himself took the helm. The action that shippers thought would defeat Flavel became his route to an even more effective bar piloting and towing business. Uh, kind of an insight into the, the timeliness of uh, Flavel in his uh, operation. A humorous incident occurred when a journalist from Portland visited Astoria, but found because of the P 
putrid smell in the city, she needed to close her nostrils with her frilly handkerchief. A dead whale had floated into the harbor. And finally, Flavel was hired to tow it out across the bar. For ship passengers traveling to this growing town, Captain Flavel built the Occident Hotel near the waterfront, known as the nicest in town. It's a two-story hotel on the second floor. Uh, the word Occident uh, is, is across the, the top. The first story has men lounging around uh, outside doors. There's a barber pole uh, mounted on the outside. And of course, a wooden sidewalk in front of the hotel as all the sidewalks were wooden. A great occasion for the hotel was the visit of President Rutherford B. Hayes. A huge crowd welcomed him along with host editor and mayor DC Ireland. He was the editor of the newspaper in town. School children formed two single lines to welcome the president, one on each side of the street leading from the wharf to the Occident Hotel. As the president arrived, the children sang America and threw flowers in the path of the arriving party. Town bands played and a dinner party was hosted by the Occident Hotel dining room. Interesting, in the years of Flavel's peak activity, I'll put it as 1870 to 1890, the city enjoyed an economic boom growing by over 1,000 percent from 639 residents to 7,127. Actually, a more accurate figure is over the whole span of Flavel's work in Astoria, the city increased by 16 fold. And much credit has to be given to the safe passage of ships tended by Flavel's pilots and ship captains came to trust them. Flavel began in the 1870s to take positions of public trust. First elected to the Astoria Board of Trustees, the equivalent of a city council. He personally targeted some of his own concerns, city streets and fire protection. Fire was a great hazard to the town because everything was built of wood, even the sidewalks. And if you follow the history of a story, it seems they were every 20 or 30 years, they had a major fire and parts of the town would burn. Favell donated a Honeywell hand pumper fire engine to assist their firefighting. And then later, he assisted the city in getting a steam fire pump, the latest technology to fight fire. He was also elected to the office of Clatsop County Treasurer, reflecting his skill in finances. He was then elected to the Astoria School Board, where his daughter Nellie was an honor student. Also in the 1870s, Flavel extended his docks and wharfs by purchasing 50,000 feet of lumber and 800 pilings. The piles were driven home by an 1800 pound hammer dropping from a height of 40 feet. The new wharf continued the effort to upgrade Astoria as a functional seaport. As part of the attacks on Flavel, and these continued, the most successful man in Astoria, he was accused of holding a stranglehold on the bar. One editorial called him this bloodsucker at the bar. In 1875, William Reed, secretary of the Portland, Portland Board of Trade, wrote a letter to the Oregonian critical of Flavel, accusing him of gouging vessels for pilotage or towing through the Columbia River bar. He threatened to sue Flavel in the U.S. District Court. Flavel answered the accusations in his local newspaper, The Astorian, he reminded readers that he had never had the exclusive monopoly of pilotage or towage. Ship captains and owners had other choices if they didn't like his rates. But ship captains came to trust he and his team implicitly. The town editor of the Astorian wrote that Flavel and his team had piloted hundreds of vessels across the bar. He said, not an accident has occurred to a single vessel having one of these pilots or one of these tugs in crossing or recrossing. All the attempts to displace 
Clavel and his team failed because the ship captains and owners trusted them over the decades. In 1878, another attempt, five captains and bar pilots, by stationing the schooner rescue outside the entrance of the bar, the effort was short-lived and unsuccessful. In the 1880s, again, someone sought to displace Clavel and his pilot team in tugs. The tug J.C. Cousins arrived on the bar, captained by George Wood, one of the captains who had sought to displace Flavel with the rescue two years previously. They competed with Flavel for two and a half years at the river entrance until the ship was taken outbound by four men and wrecked on clats of spit. None of the men who had taken the ship outbound uh, was a pilot. And again, an unpiloted ship was lost. Unfortunately, this was a relatively common occurrence for a ship attempting to cross the bar without a pilot. For captains or sailors to assume they could cross the Columbia River bar without a pilot was often disastrous. But none of these multiple attacks reduced Flavel's popularity in Astoria. People saw the attacks as an attempt to malign Astoria's reputation. To attack Flavel was seen to be attacking Astoria. Though Astoria failed to supplant Portland in trade, industries that mushroomed around Astoria were canneries and lumber. In the 1880s, four lumber mills and box factories operated along the Astoria waterfront. In 1866, pioneer George Hunt put up 4,000 cases of salmon. But by 1873, eight canneries were operating along the Columbia, and 10 years later, 39 canneries packed a record catch of 42.8 million pounds of salmon, or about 630,000 cases. But gradually, the area became overfished. To enhance Astoria's growth, rail connections were needed to Portland, but they would not be added until after Clavel's death. Astoria lobbied Congress for ways to improve the conditions at the Columbia River Bar to increase the depth at the bar. At first, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers downplayed the need for improvement. Finally, they recommended stabilizing the sands at the entrance of the Columbia. The plan called for a four and a half mile jetty from near Fort Stevens to a point three miles south of Cape Disappointment. That was the one that was eventually built. They concluded that the jetty would scour a 30 foot deep channel to um, and, and the cost was $2 million. Within two years of its completion, the worth of the tonnage passing over the bar more than doubled. A story in early Astoria brought out Flavel's business acumen. Supposedly a ne'er-do-well aired his disgust that Captain Flavel had more money than the other Astorians. Another historian answered, if every dollar in Astoria were divided equally among every male in town, in six months or a year at most, Captain Flavel would have most of it, and you'd be working for him, and so would I. And what's more, it would all be done fair and square, and now it's characteristic of Flavel, fair and square. Captain George Flavel outwardly had an austere nature. Paul McKean Bell, the family friend, commented on the captain's character. The personality of this great man differed decidedly from his maritime contemporaries. These others were genial and hearty characters, quick at making friends such as the sea produces whenever there's fair weather for sailing. Captain Flavel, the most successful among them, was austere in manner, very reserved and very dignified. He was striking in appearance, tall and erect his hair and beard curly and reddish, his eyes gray and piercing. And if you go to the Favelle house and see the portrait, uh, it'll show that reddish hair. And uh, you, you may see his uh, picture here. It is a man with a black suit coat, white tie, uh, bow tie. He has a beard. He looks uh, distinguished and serious, uh, but he was uh, um, an impressive, dignified looking man. But he also had a generous and benevolent nature. This came out when Polly's oldest brother was brought home to die. 
and mom was worn out by long nursing. After the death, the captain suggested to the family that they go down to his farm on Tansy Point for the rest of the summer until the mother felt more herself. Polly says the farm was a wonderful place for children. They had horses to ride and a collie with six delightful puppies. Mary Flavel was also known for her quiet generosity and care for others. Though some in the community felt she should dress and play the part of a millionaire's wife, and they had terms that they uh, used in reference to her because they thought she should dress fancy. She was simple and plain. You remember, she and her family had come across on the plains as pioneers. And when they lived early in Astoria, when they moved there, uh, they lived in the Shark House, which was, may have been the most humble dwelling in Astoria, but it was all they could find for lodging. For a number of years, Captain Flavel had planned to build a larger home reflective of his wealth and standing with special features for members of his family, such as a music room for the girls, uh, a place appropriate for hospitality for friends, and they treasured their friends, and service to the community, such as they would, uh, for the girls, hold uh, musical uh, practices, choir practices in the home. In 1884, the captain commissioned German-born architect Carl Leich to design a new residence. Leich had advertised his architectural services in the Daily Astoria, Flavel had purchased the block he wanted as the site many years before and left the ground preparation to his gardener, Old Lewis. The large Victorian house reflected the taste of the era, which was lavish. Light designed the house in the Queen Anne style, the most prominent residential style during the late Victorian era, 1880 to 1910. The house had an asymmetrical facade or front appearance hip roof with lower cross gables and a full width one story front porch. Ornamentation included cast iron crusting, stained glass windows and decorative work above the window moldings. It had a prominent three story octagonal tower with a conical roof. From the tower, the captain could view activity on the bar, arriving ships or the Astoria Harbor. Later, fellow employee uh, with like refers to him as being a perfectionist and said of him, woe betide any carpenter, helper, or anyone else who made the slightest error or tried to get by with any shoddy work. He was a perfectionist. Like would later go on to design many lighthouses along the coast. Nellie Flavel in her diary remembers buying some of the materials for the home in San Francisco. She says at one point Tuesday night, Mr. Like came and brought us mail from home and the plans for the house. On Wednesday, Mr. Like went with us to the stores to look at mantles. On February 13th, 1885, she notes yesterday, we all went and selected the stained glass windows. As you may know, the unique mantles and stained glass windows are beautiful features of the home. Once back in Astoria, Nellie records vandalism of their new home. She said last night someone attempted to burn down our new house, but the fire did not burn. The one of the handsome doors is pretty badly burned, but the door was redwood and the fire went out. As the most prominent man in Astoria, Flavel was always the object of hatred by some. One evidence of that is another unbelievable attack when someone tried to shoot and kill uh, their Newfoundland St. Bernard called Lion, their family dog, the shooter only wounded the dog and he recovered. Paula McKean Bell describes how she was affected by her first view of the new mansion. She says, when my sister and I walked over to see that grand dwelling, I could scarcely believe my eyes. I had the feeling that if I shut my eyes and opened them again, it would be gone. There it stood, stately and ornate, with tall bay windows, porches, handsome doors, and a tall, beautiful tower on the northeast corner. And she says of the tower, and the tower was Captain Favell's marine telescope, which brought before our eyes the splendid panorama of the bar. And you'll see a picture of the mansion now, as it appeared then. But around the home are 
horses and carriages on the streets on the uh, outside of the mansion. But the mansion itself is a two-story mansion with uh, um, stained glass windows, but an impressive, beautiful mansion. The family moved into the home April 15th, 1886. Much of the furniture was moved from their smaller home nearby. Perhaps in part to celebrate their new home, the family held a large dinner for their friends and a musical performance by the girls in the music room. The carriage house that housed the captain's carriage and three horses, Buckskin, Buckskin Tilly and Chance, was finished in 1887. And if you visit the home, you will see the carriage house. As a matter of fact, you'll start there and register there. The mansion remains a must see in Astoria. It became available after the final surviving member of the family died, Nellie Flavel in 1933. The property went to grandniece Patricia Flavel and she eventually deeded the house to Clatsop County. In 1951, the house was deeded to the Clatsop County Historical Society and opened to the public in 1952. And the Clatsop County Historical Society does some uh, wonderful things and they do a great job with the house. By the mid 1880s, Flavel had begun making plans to retire from day-to-day -day management of his bar piloting business in 1887, at age 64, and after 38 years as master and branch pilot, Favell sold his interest in the bar piloting business to his longtime 30-year partner, Asa Mead Simpson. Favell then concentrated his efforts on his farm at Tansy Point. One of the last transactions Captain Favell made involved selling his Tansy Point farm and land to the Flavel Land and Development Company, not owned by Flavel, but owned by others, the potential development spot had expanded to 2,000 acres, and the buyers planned a large rail and seaport facility, which boomed twice, but ultimately failed. In the early 1990s, uh, 1890s, Flavel encountered ill health. He went to San Francisco to attempt to regain his health but on the return trip caught a cold that developed into pneumonia. He died in his own bedroom, July 3rd, 19, 1893. The Astoria Daily Budget noted the sad news of the passing away of Captain George Flavel last Monday evening, cast a gloom over this entire community where he was known to almost every man, woman, and child and highly esteemed and beloved by all. Astoria will miss Captain Flavel. Flavel's wife, Mary, gave a note about her husband's success. One of the reasons why my husband made a success as a pilot on the Columbia River Bar was that he was not only an able navigator, but he was fearless and willing to put out in any sort of weather to assist vessels in need of help. She said also Captain George Flavel was a man who could master fate. Other men had equal opportunity but he made the most of his and bent conditions to his profit. Thank you for traveling with me through the life of Captain George Flavel. One of the ways that you can see a view of the life of Captain Flavel and his family is to visit the Flavel house in Astoria where you'll see some visual clues to their life. For more information about the Columbia River, the bar, shipping, bar pilots, visit the Columbia River Maritime Museum. It's a, it's a great, uh, great treat. My book, Captain George Flavel, is available on Amazon, along with the audiobook. If you enjoy listening to your books, uh, one of my daughters, Joelle, made the chapters on Mary Flavel and the house uh, for the audiobook on Amazon. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Fort Clatsop and in their footsteps, journeys of stories and insights. Thank you for listening.